All right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Again, my name is Dana Bookbinder and um, at EcoSpark we're starting, um, we're actually in the second year of a really exciting program called Caterpillars Count, um, which is a wider initiative that we're um, really excited about engaging uh, not only community members, but also students, teachers, um, even individual volunteers um, to get outdoors and take some uh, simple environmental measurements uh, from local trees. So we have actually um, an assistant of ours who's also a University of Toronto student, as many of you are, um, is uh, in the field right now actually collecting some of the uh, info, which is why she's not here today. Um, but I'm going to uh, sort of take us through what the, um, what the activity is. And uh, you could consider whether this is a good fit for you if you want to start your own Caterpillars Count um, observation site. Uh, we'll sort of explain the, the hows and whys um, and then provide you with a lot of resources. So as you're going, EcoSpark can help you um, make that project successful and meet your own goals uh, as students as you're taking part in that. So I'm going to share. This is sort of a hybrid presentation. Um, can I get a thumbs up if that's working? Uh, Holly, are you there? Can you let me know if you can see? Okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so what I've done, the Caterpillars Count project is based in the University of North Carolina and it's a community-based project. So they're looking for groups all over um, to take part, all over North America, basically. Um, so EcoSpark is a regional coordinator for Caterpillars Count, but a lot of the slides and the information that you're seeing today are provided from that research team that's an academic lab at University of North Carolina. So I'm going to start with a little background on who we are at EcoSpark and then go into more of the nitty gritty of what the project is. And we're such a small group, if you're comfortable during the presentation, if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask, or you can use the chat feature. So I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land where EcoSpark has its office is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the, uh, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Meti peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the credit. And then, so usually we give land acknowledgement sort of locally, um, but during the pandemic, we've had the opportunity to work with groups further afield, um, sometimes on an international scale. I had some students from Texas and a group um, the other day. So uh, expanding on that, we acknowledge that the land where EcoSpark runs programs, the, sort of the traditional territory of many nations and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Meti peoples. And EcoSpark is a, a charity. We have a staff of about five, so you're seeing a large portion of us um, on the greetings today as some, um, some of my colleagues are kind enough to join. Uh, EcoSpark empowers people to protect and sustain the local environment. We do this uh, through the idea of discovering nature, acting to um, protect it and actually get involved in some of those activities that are often um, people consider like separate and just in academia or uh, maybe even just the government would take these measurements. We're getting a lot of local communities involved um, and uh, building on that to create a culture of change. So even in our school programs, when we have grade six uh, students going out and collecting data, they understand that they're part of a bigger movement um, that can understand how our environment is changing and how we can change it for the better. Our student programs uh, fall into two categories. There's changing currents, uh, which is that water, qual uh, water quality program that uh, some mentioned in the introductions. Um, and changing currents can be related to the project that we're going to talk about today, um, because as we know, um, the health of our forests really has an effect on the health of our waterways. Um, so that's worth taking a look at. All of our resources are available at ecospark.ca. So for example, you can pull up um, a map of the past 20 years of data collected by students and other volunteers such as yourselves that show um, how that water quality uh, can change over time and what people are doing 
to improve it. In addition, uh, the program that I'm most affiliated with is called School Watch, and we have a sister project to that called Park Watch, where we're training students and teachers and volunteers to collect terrestrial data. So it could be a 15 minute bird count um, from a school ground during the pandemic. It's often from people's backyards and their parks and their community groups and balcony surveys. Um, trying to collect information about nearby nature um, and pulling all of that together in really exciting online uh, web maps to um, compare, for example, how many pigeons do I find versus you and what does that mean for the urban environment. Finally, our Greenbelt Youth Ambassadors are a really exciting group. Um, folks your age, uh, so uh, high school up through age 30, are involved in this um, sort of volunteer environmental leadership group. Um, they're very active. They're setting up webinars to teach other people about the green belt. Of course, our um, the area of, of land and protected areas around our urban centers that are providing us with clean air and clean water and habitat. And the green belt would be a great place to take a look at caterpillars count. It includes um, urban ravines. Uh, right through the city. So if some of you are considering uh, perhaps looking at an area on campus, you could look at what also qualifies as Greenbelt and maybe take a look at the Youth Ambassadors resources to tie it all together. What this, um, this kind of project is housed under is called citizen science. And that's an old term. It's also called community science. Um, if you haven't heard of it before, it's just this idea of studying nearby nature together. So involving people um, who might or might not have a scientific background in the data collection itself, um, and then making sense of the kinds of things that they're finding. So a photo of a bird, um, trying to find the identification for that bird by sharing the photo online um, with other naturalists. Uh, asking questions about um, critters that are in our nearby spaces, uh, a monarch butterfly caterpillar on a plant that you find right outside your door, um, and then uh, taking that to the next step. So being a little bit more curious about what you're finding uh, can lead us to uh, test and explore our own hypotheses. And especially with students, we're trying to um, encourage people to follow their own interests wherever it may lead. So with caterpillars count, if you're more keen on the bugs and you wanna look at that, that's great. If you're a plant person and wanna learn about the effects of um, insects on the forest, you can study that. And if you're into birds, we've got that piece as well. All of this together by having um, many, many people take part and help gather just a little bit of information uh, can help us solve the local and global problems that we're all facing. So you'll see how this project relates to climate change in particular and how everybody can take a part in, um, in contributing to that uh, larger picture that is so important for all of us to learn about. So without further ado, as I mentioned, um, Caterpillars Count is from the University of North Carolina. And I'm going to share in the chat the website. Give me one sec here. I didn't have the chat open. I should be watching this if anyone has questions. All right, so let me know if you have any issues accessing that website itself. This is gonna be your resource. If you're interested in accessing the data that others have found in Caterpillar's Count, if you wanna try setting up your own site, this is where you would register. And there's also a ton of information about um, the kinds of bugs that you might see and training tools to get you all set up to do a little bit of a study. Alan Hol Holbert and Sarah Yelton um, put together some resources here. Uh, it's actually Dr. Holbert is the lead of this project. Um, so he's got a lot of videos on the website and you can hear from him directly as well. And just to clarify, EcoSpark's role with Caterpillars Count is to train park and school groups uh, throughout the greater Toronto area um, to take part in the study and encourage more people to set up a research site. And then we're mapping that local Caterpillars Count data with local context. 
So drawing from our change in currents program where we have a lot of water quality, our bird watching and other terrestrial projects, we're pulling it all together to learn a little bit more about what it means for Ontario um, and how phenology or the timing of all of these things um, has a very local effect. You can follow news from our demo site, uh, which is located at Brookbanks Park in North York. Um, we're available at ecospark.ca. So throughout this summer in particular, we'll be sharing um, 10 minute updates and um, uh, there's a story map where you can see how text and images of this demo site uh, give you an easy um, way to picture what it looks like when you're actually in the field. Um, this, so this again is from the research study and because you all are science students, I'm gonna go ahead and include some of this technical information. Um, if I'm moving too quickly or if you still have questions, please share in the chat, but I want you to see how, how deep it can go just to collect a little bit of information. The idea with this study, Caterpillars Count, is to study the timing of seasonal activities in animals and plants as they relate to each other. So phenology is the name for that. Um, and you can see here uh, uh, throughout the seasons, um, we can take a, sort of a snapshot of what's going on in a given um, forest or even as small as 10 trees that are in an urban lot. Um, and you can, you can take a snapshot of that to tell you a lot more about the wider ecosystem. So we're looking in particular in caterpillars. The study can take place anytime that there's leaves on the trees. So for Toronto area, it's about May through October. And every year we're looking to gather more information so we can compare year to year. The reason that we're interested in looking at timing um, it's because the, uh, the biodiversity that's around us um, relies on certain timing cues. Uh, so birds, when they're nesting, uh, need to feed their young insects. And if the insects haven't hatched out yet, then their, their birds go hungry, their um, babies go hungry and they can't successfully reproduce. So it's really important for many bird species that they have insects at the right time when they're laying their eggs and then um, fledging chicks. What happens to the timing of these events as the temperatures rise? So um, looking at climate change, you can see in the little chart here, hopefully a very familiar picture of the global average surface temperature rising um, since the 1850s. Uh, researchers are very interested in the, the specifics of how this temperature rise affects various species. So for example, you can see there uh, the caterpillar um, hatching has slid earlier. So if the insects have already um, moved through their caterpillar phase, but the, um, the bird species are not lined up with that timing, then that could be bad for the birds. Some birds can shift the timing of their migration to adjust to changing climate. So um, up north here, as the birds are arriving, some of them are able to arrive earlier. And the question is which species are able to do that uh, to, to adequately um, feed their young. Here's an example of um, one bird that would be able to adapt. So you can see the arrival date of that bird in this graph um, has uh, shifted and it's able to adapt. However, other species are having trouble adjusting. So these species are not able, as far as we can tell from research like caterpillars count, are not able to adapt as well to that shift in the insect timing. So the barn swallow, the eastern wood peewee, and the rose-breasted grosbeak are three examples of birds that are in decline. You can see their abundance going down, and it's thought that this may be related to their food source and the timing of that adjusted with climate change. In addition, because caterpillars count is looking at insects on trees, 
um, we can draw a lot of other really important information from, from the surveys that volunteers are doing. Insects are showing widespread declines globally. Um, and there's a lot of information as well. If you're interested in pursuing this uh, as a, an independent project, for example, EcoSpark can kind of give you more tailored resources along any of these um, uh, chains of study. But the core question um, that we're looking at is quantifying bird food, in other words, insects in an area and how that varies over time. So it's really um, important that we are looking at lots of different study sites and then preferably looking at them over time. So in Toronto, we started at Brookbanks Park last year. Um, as I mentioned, a student is on site at Brookbanks Park this year as well, doing weekly surveying of those same, same trees to see if there's any difference and hopefully for many years into the future. So the challenge that, that are the arthropods, so all this, creepy crawlies, bugs and spiders and so on, are patchily distributed and they need to have, we need to have a high sampling effort with repeated monitoring. So lots of people helping out. This is what it looks like if you go to the Caterpillars Count website. And again, that's in the chat if anybody uh, needs to access it with the link. Uh, it provides uh, an overview and the background information, as well as tabs to participate, explore the data, learn, and then you can create your own account and sign in so you can manage your own site if you're participating. Um, now, I really like to point out this explore tab, sort of the heart and soul of citizen science and why I'm so passionate about it is that all of the data gets shared publicly. So it's not just being owned by somebody else who's interested in looking at this and publishing some paper, although that happens. It's made in real time available to the people who are actually interested in gathering the information for their local park or community. Um, it's uh, very easy to use their tools online to download your own data and everybody else's data. So you can compare and contrast what you're finding and what that really means in context. The, the um, protocol itself, during the pandemic in particular, they've really opened this up. So it's encouraged um, for anybody who wants to get involved to give it a try. And there's no harm in making a site, even if you have just one tree and you wanna just go out once and try collecting some data, you're invited to make an account and do that. However, if you have at least 30, survey trees, so we'll see what that means, but 30 branches that you can look at regularly, then that brings it up to a level of research grade um, data that is most useful for answering some of those bigger phenology questions. Um, and specifically, if you have about two and a half person hours uh, per week, or I would say at least six times throughout the growing season, so maybe every other week, um, then that gives you enough uh, data, enough time to look at all 30 trees and provide some repeated monitoring. So it's suggested, and I think it works well for EgoSpark, it's worked well for having um, one student spend one afternoon a week just devoted to Caterpillar's count. And then we have a really hearty, wonderful data set that comes out of that. Um, but again, you don't, there's no obligation at all, but if you are curious to try it, you could do this with one tree with 10 trees. Um, 10 trees would kind of give you a mini picture of what's going on. You can get some useful data from that. And then if you have 30 trees, um, that's great. They can actually include that in the published research and compare site to site um, with what's going on in North Carolina and in Vermont and everywhere else that people are, are taking part. So what it looks like, if you were able to set up a survey site, um, this is a beautiful forested area. And so it looks very easy to pick trees here. Um, but in Brookbanks Park where we're looking, it's, it's much patchier. There's like a playground and paved areas. Um, and we've very easily found enough trees. And then I was looking, I live near a Bathurst station in downtown Toronto. And I was able through the alleyways and front yard trees and so on um, to find enough branches 
in my neighborhood to set up um, sort of a fake caterpillars count site. So looking at the school ground and other areas where I can easily access trees. I think this is totally doable. Toronto is considered the, um, the city within a forest. So we do have enough sampling areas, even if you're not in a like legitimate forest um, to do this. This is what it looks like. You would set up five different circles um, and uh, there's a central tree. And then you have four trees, um, maybe uh, three to five meters away from that central tree. This is kind of an idealized way to set up 30 trees where you only have to go um, to, sorry, six different locations. So it's six locations with five trees and that makes 30. <laughs> Here's what it looks like on a map. A lot of um, different uh, na naturalist organizations are taking part. So this is uh, the North Carolina Botanical Gardens site. And you can see they've made a really simple map to share their information. And then they can have volunteers even who are visiting this nature center learn about caterpillars count and even help with the surveys. So they've got um, even more, they have eight uh, uh, groups along their streamside trail where they're looking at trees. So what do you do after you have identified some trees that you could look at? Um, what we're interested in is the caterpillars, but also the other bugs, any kind of spider or insect that might be on a low branch. So the tree has to have some branch that you could reach, as you can see in this picture. And then you have a choice. Uh, you can run caterpillars count using only visual surveys where you're just literally looking for the insects along that one branch that you can see and recording the data in their caterpillars count app or even on a data sheet to later enter into a website. A different way that you can do it and the way that EcoSpark prefers and recommends is by using what's called a beat sheet. So you can see this guy here has some kind of kite-like device and it's just um, a piece of fabric that you hold underneath the branch and then you whack the branch with a small stick, um, not enough to break it, but enough to dislodge the insects that are on that branch and they fall onto the sheet and that's a lot easier and faster to see and count what it is that you found at that branch. So they say it takes about two and a half hours per week to look at all of the trees. Um, but if you had trees that were an easy walking distance from each other, I think you could get pretty good at it um, and even do 30 trees faster than that uh, using this beat sheet method. The beat sheet is also a really good way to engage others in caterpillars count. So you can imagine um, a teacher doing this with a class and all the students could gather around and see what bugs uh, were there and trying to identify them. You could do this uh, to lead a little nature walk uh, with a community group at a park, for example. And then what is it that you're looking for? You don't have to be an expert um, uh, in identification to gather the kind of information that we need for cater caterpillars count. Um, basically, a lot of different bugs are bird food and the birds are pretty um, indiscriminate. Like they all use a lot of different kinds of insects. Um, so it's just asking you to identify to the order, to order level. Uh, for example, caterpillars versus beetles versus flies versus spiders. And I'm pretty sure if I showed you guys a picture of a beetle and a spider, you could already tell the difference. So you probably already have the skills that you need uh, to identify arthropods to order. However, there's some really great training resources on the Caterpillars Count website. Um, I like to go through uh, just an overview of what the orders are as a quick reminder, but I'm gonna stop share it and if you'll just give me one second. Can hear birds outside my window today, that's exciting. Um, and I'm going to show you what it looks like in real time for that training online. 
can I get a thumbs up, please, if uh, you can see this? I can see. Okay, that's great. Thanks, guys. All right. So for the Caterpillar's Talent website, um, as I mentioned, there's all these tabs at the part at the top, and if you go into them, uh, there's even more details: how to conduct a survey, submit observations, and so on. What I really like to do is go into this Learn tab and sort of start folks with the virtual survey game. So we can play this right now all together. Just takes a moment to load. But this is a training tool to help you practice your skills before you get out and look at a branch um, to try and guess what kind of arthropod you've found. So as soon as it loads, you'll see we'll have the opportunity to look at a pretend branch um, and kind of uh, guess or uh, use what knowledge we already have to identify the, the arthropod you can try and rack up points and so on. So you can standardize your own skills. Okay, so you can see I can move around this magnifying glass. And oh, there we have, can anybody type in the chat what you think this might be? These little guys that are attached. Oh, and I can't see the chat. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll show you a demo. Okay, so let's look at this other one here. Those are the only ones that I've seen so far. I'm going to click on it and then select what I think it is. So all of you can guess to yourself. And I'm going to guess that we have here a spider. And then you have to um, enter a link. So you can see with the scale here, um, it mimics when you would hold a ruler up to it in the field to look at how big it is. And I'm going to say that's about 20 millimeters. Save. And ta-da, you have successfully identified the arthropod group. The actual length of the arthropod is 7 millimeters, but you said 20 millimeters. You gained 10 points. OK, so I was a little bit off. I was rushing there on, um, on my size. All right, so you can see how you can practice all of those using the online tools. Are there any questions about that and how that resource could be helpful to you? Okay, awesome, we'll keep going a little bit. So what we're gonna do next is uh, briefly go through four or five different of those orders that you might encounter. Um, and this is kind of neat. I have a five-year-old and he's super excited about ladybugs. And you can see uh, a ladybug would fall into this slide because it's a beetle. The reason is that you have um, a hard shell for a beetle, so you can look for the straight line where the wing casings of that hard shell meet. And all of these examples you can see have uh, a line right down the middle, like our ladybug classic line down the middle for that outer wing covering. Um, and they kind of go tink. <laughs> if, you, if you imagine a ladybug falling off a leaf onto something hard, it goes tink, right? It, it is covered in that hard shell. Of note as well, and one exception would be a larval form. So the young of a beetle looks a little bit different. And Caterpillar's Count offers that resource and even the reminder in the app that you can look for um, specifically larval beetles as well. This shows the ladybug or the ladybug. Uh, beetle larva up above it. Very cool little critters. They also bite, uh, I've learned. Um, and just to mention on that, the, um, the bugs that you might encounter during caterpillars count, I think are a great way to introduce um, students and others to insect observation without getting too up close and personal. Um, so if you have folks worried about pollinators and stings, this is an alternate because the way that you um, approach a branch and then use that beach sheet to look at arm's length at the, the critters, it's very unlikely that you would have any bites or stings. And um, that said, we always use caution and especially if you're taking out um, youth, you wanna make sure that everyone's aware of common safety um, and dressing for the possibility of ticks. Uh, so long pants tucked into your socks if you're going out into the woods and doing studies. And we have some great resources at EcoSpark that we can share with you if you're interested in, in um, some of those sort of practical know-hows for going out um, to look at trees and bugs. Okay, so that's our beetles. Our true bugs, 
Um, so they're called true bugs because these are the only ones that officially get that name bug. Um, you're going to look for the X on the back. Um, things like stink bugs. Um, you, can, you can sort of picture that they have this X where their wings overlap instead of like the beetles where they come together in the straight line. Um, and just a note on their young, on the top right, the nymphs or the young don't have their wings yet. So they won't show that X. Now you have the op opportunity to take a photo of any bug that you can't identify to order. And there's a whole protocol or a sort of like an easy out. Um, so you can report something as unknown and then hopefully get an identification from the community if you didn't, if you weren't sure if this was a beetle or a true bug. Leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, and cicadas are in the next order. They usually have a wide head relative to the body. Hoppers, uh, like uh, these ones on the right, they have wings folded tent-like over their back and they hop. Uh, so it's often very tiny. That one on the bottom right is like pinky fingernail size and it would leap like um, bigger than uh, a foot off that leaf. So you can see they're very hoppy. Cicadas have large membranous wings and they're quite famous now as we start hearing them calling. There's a big brood coming out. Um, so a lot of really neat science with the bugs as well. Aphids and I think this is pronounced silids are yellowish, greenish, or whitish in color. They usually are less than five millimeters and often less than two millimeters. Aphids had round, have rounded pointy butts. <laughs> um, so you can picture uh, like in a bug's life, they're going and they have little aphids that they're farming That's because ants can come and um, actually drink the nectar off of their aphids. So you'll see these in a group all together usually. Grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids tend to be more familiar to folks. They have large hind legs for jumping and their hind wings uh, when open are spread like fans. And so you can imagine this one might uh, be one of the first to hop off of your beach sheet. So you'd wanna take a, a quick look at what you see before they kind of disappear back into the foliage. Spiders and daddy long legs are two different groups. And so the main difference here is that Spiders um, have an abdomen distinct from the rest of the body, whereas daddy long legs, their head and their abdomen appear to be part of a single round body, like a sort of a floating dot with those big long legs. Um, caterpillars. So caterpillars are definitely the most notable. It's really important when you do a survey to try and include everything that you see. Um, and it's great if you can get a photo of all those different bugs. But in particular, if you find a caterpillar, it's recommended that you include a photo. Um, that's because we're most interested in studying them for bird food. Um, and there's also a lot of other side studies like invasive gypsy moth caterpillars um, that people are interested in. So EcoSpark's done a lot of work at Brookmanks Park with um, the gypsy moth as, as well with learning about it. So if you see a caterpillar, and note that it might be camouflaged. You can see that one on the top right is actually, it looks like a stick, but it's actually a caterpillar with very, very, very effective camouflage. So especially if you're doing those visual surveys and you're not going to the beach sheet, you wanna make sure you examine every leaf and twig on, um, it's a small branch that you're looking at. It's not the whole tree, it's just, um, like 50 leaves or less, but you have to really look on the underside and the top and every twig um, to make sure you count everything. If it's a caterpillar, you can also note, um, and it asks you in the app, if it's in a silk tent, in a leaf roll, or if it's hairy or spiny. And those things tend to be pretty obvious, but you can always include the photo. And it's recommended to help you identify what caterpillar you found. So, um, again, we're only identifying to order. You can practice your ID skills with the online quiz. And the whole point is that we're looking at what kind of food is available um, to the kinds of birds that eat bugs off of leaves. And um, in our case, that's a lot of the migrant birds that are coming through um, and really making uh, a home here um, and an important way for their young. As uh, you explore a bit more on the website, uh, you can access, again, those identification skills under the Learn tab. 
and also find printables. So things to make it very easy for you to set up your own site. Each branch of your site has a unique three letter survey code. So uh, if you sign in and make a site, you'll enter basic information about where you're located. Um, and then you can uh, print out uh, tree tags. So it's helpful if you can identify uh, what tree species you're looking at and that helps standardize it. And we also at EcoSpark have a lot of resources to help you figure out what trees you have. Um, and then this is what it looks like in the field. So you can see it's very um, non-invasive. We are comfortable uh, temporarily putting um, tags up into public spaces. Um, and if you have other ideas or comments on this, uh, you can feel, feel free and get in touch with us at EcoSpark as we develop the pilot of this project. Um, but you kind of waterproof your tag either with tape or by getting it laminated, and then you can return to it the next week and see the same branch um, and what's happened there. And that's very important that we remove all tags, um, no matter where you are at the end of the season, even if it's your own private tree, you wanna make sure that the tree has room to grow and isn't gonna be um, putting, you're not putting trash into the environment. This is what it looks like to use the mobile app. Um, so uh, if you open it up, you can enter your information about your site um, and it automatically has like the time of the survey. Uh, you would select if you're doing a visual or a beach sheet survey and if the leaves are wet. So we went on, on a very rainy day to set up last week, which was exciting to have a field day. Um, but we, all of them, we noted that it was wet leaves because that affects the insects. The next screen, you can see at the top, there's little dots to help you follow. So the second one has the picture of a bug and that's where you enter your arthropod information. And there's a simple drop down menu, even a little visual reminder of what the ant um, group would look like and so on. And then um, if you select that you did have an arthropod after you looked at that branch, uh, you would enter in all the specific information. So for example, this person found four ants that were all three millimeters. And one was a bigger ant that was 10 millimeters. And yay, they found a caterpillar and that was larger, it was 35 millimeters. Um, so in that caterpillar drop down menu, it would have details about if it's in a silk roll or just a few more questions about it. Um, but it's as simple as adding what you found. And then the final one where it has an icon of a tree at the top is uh, plant information. So they're gonna ask you, um, it should be, it should be the same week to week. So once you identify that you have a sugar maple, um, you'll already know that and it's very quick to enter it. It should also be the same every week, how many leaves you looked at, because you have that tag, you can just look at every leaf that's on the end of the branch past your tag. Um, and we are almost always between 20 and 30 leaves. So they have this huge number of leaves. I think that's more if you have like a conifer but for the most part, we're looking at um, like uh, 20 leaves or so. You would do the average leaf length and that's to help us standardize. All of this is so we can compare one place to another. So how many bugs per leaf area are we finding? Well, we need to know the leaf, um, the size of the leaves. Um, so you can, what we do for the average leaf length is we measure three leaves and then just put the average of that. You don't have to measure every leaf at every survey uh, to do this. The herbivory score. So this is uh, to tell you how chomped on the leaves are. Um, so if it's moderate, for example, then you've got a lot of holes uh, starting to get eaten into those leaves, um, which also tells you a little bit about the insect activity. So as I mentioned, our student is able to do this entire thing for a branch in under three minutes, because um, depending on what they find, it can be very quick data entry in the field once you're kind of familiar with, with what to enter. You can also manage your site. Um, even using the app, you can share your site password. So your class could, for example, work together uh, on the same site and just share the password around all of those students or volunteers working at that site. And that would be a way, if you don't have a half day a week to commit 
um, to caterpillars count. Uh, or if you want to do this with a group, uh, you could each go out um, once a month and look at all of the trees. And then it, it sort of reduces the um, time commitment there. The app works uh, even if you don't have Wi-Fi, but um, you have to reconnect to submit that data afterwards. Uh, you can use the app to manage the site, change your password, edit your tree uh, species names. So let's say you go out into the field and you're not quite sure if it's a maple or an oak, um, but you can snap a photo of it um, and then go back in later once you have that tree ID um, and edit any of the information for your survey. There's also a web-based data entry. So if you wanna be unplugged out there and writing in your notebook, you can print out worksheets um, and then enter it back into your uh, uh, web-based data form. Okay, and we're almost done here. Um, just a reminder that you can uh, test online your skills and sort of get familiar with this before you go out. Um, so for example, you could maybe set up a project where you're testing with the app and make you know, go all the way through all of that data entry um, with their online training form. Uh, there is an additional resource available to you uh, to help you identify both the bugs that you're finding and things like the tree species. And that's called iNaturalist. EcoSpark offers separate training on all the details of how to use iNaturalist and get started with it. Um, but you're welcome to explore it on your own. It's pretty easy to follow. There's a lot of help menus and so on. iNaturalist is a citizen science database that's online um, where uh, people sign up for free, uh, submit nature photos, and then anybody else can comment um, and offer suggestions in particular on the identification of what they found. Uh, so you can learn more about, uh, is this bug uh, an invasive? Um, where is this tree located? Would I be able to compare my data with um, further south, further north, and so on? Lots and lots of information about all the species that we're finding. So the photos that you submit to the Caterpillars Count website do get shared onto the Caterpillars Count iNaturalist page, and you'll have all that information available um, from what you submit in app for Caterpillars Count as well. Finally, as I mentioned, Caterpillars Count has a lot of ways for you to explore the data after you submit. So you can see here's uh, a map that's several years old now of all of the Caterpillars Count sites up through um, sort of the Eastern United States. Um, and EcoSpark is one of a handful that are taking place in our Ontario now. It is getting more widespread. When you go online, you're able to open up any of these full data sets. And there's something called a leaderboard so you can uh, sort all of the sites, learn about what month they went out, um, what caterpillars they saw and all the other data with very handy maps and graphs. And for example, at your own site, you, you could look at the composition of the different arthropod groups. So you can see here the colors correspond to those different groups we looked at, how many beetles were there versus caterpillars what is it this site for all years versus all of the sites in all of the years? Do you have more leaf hoppers than elsewhere? This is a great place to sort of make your own questions and think about what's important to you for analyzing this data. And then of course that timing. So it helps you visualize the phenology of the different arthropod groups for any site or any year, you can track what's going on and see changes over time. Finally, the last thing I'll mention is that there are a lot of really great resources for people to learn about Caterpillar's count and what it means in context. Um, so EcoSpark is developing uh, a grade six through 12 uh, curriculum linked lesson plan for Ontario with Caterpillar's count. There are some other existing resources. Um, this is in the Caterpillar's count website under classroom activities. And you can see their age sorry, age base um, and follow different areas of study with the data that everybody's collecting together. 
This is where you would sign up if you're interested in setting up a Caterpillars count site. Um, so again, that link is in the chat if you're interested. And they have, you can email the researcher. If you have te technical questions, um, you're welcome to get in touch with them directly. Again, EcoSpark is um, just collaborating on the local side of this. What we're interested in at EcoSpark is uh, to map all of our local Caterpillars count sites. So one thing that I would encourage if you um, are interested in setting this up, just send us an email. I'm Dana at ecospark.ca. I'll put that in the chat right now. And let us know that you're gonna try this out uh, so that we can help get you more localized resources if you're interested. And then potentially um, we'll be able to uh, look at the data that you do find over the summer, or maybe you only tried it out once and you have some feedback on why or why not the protocol itself is successful for you. Um, and any of that information can help us build a really strong program to get lots of local schools involved in Caterpillars Count. So we're gonna be going to the Caterpillars Count website to download any local data, um, and sharing it um, on our website at ecospark.ca alongside all of our bird and tree observations and uh, our water quality information as well. And then providing things like story maps to help get more people involved. So you can stay involved with us um, through our newsletter. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, again, the way to volunteer in Caterpillars Count at this point is to set up your own site if you're interested, explore with the website and email me if you have any questions um, or if you wanna share about your experience with Caterpillars Count on your own. We are hoping in future years to set up more in-person training with our BookBanks Park demo site and potentially other demo sites where we could all get out. Um, if you feel really stumped by uh, the resources, um, we are going to today raffle off one kit of uh, just like a getting started with Caterpillars Count um, uh, set. So the uh, materials to help you start making your beat sheet and uh, Caterpillars and other bugs guide that's sort of laminated that you could take into the field. You don't need that equipment to get started, but we wanna see if we can encourage people to take that next step and actually go out. And um, so I will share um, a link for our survey and anybody who completes the survey is entered into the drawing to win this and I'll mail it to you. Um, so you, you can actually have all that equipment and you don't have to find your own um, like packing tape to make your labels and so on. It's just in the kit ready for you to go. All right. So stay tuned for how to get that kit. Anybody, um, if you're interested in Caterpillars Count or any of the other work we do at EcoSpark, we're really excited to hear from you on social media. If you have great ideas that you think would be um, helpful for our students to learn about, other resources, things you're doing with U of T trash team or other groups at University of Toronto, please share with us. Here's all of our social media handles. And thank you for taking this time um, to be a citizen scientist, uh, learning about a new study um, and ways that you can get involved. We really look forward to hearing from you and any feedback that you might have um, on this webinar and then also on the survey itself. So I'm going to open it up for any questions at this point. And we'll take about two minutes to do any questions that might be useful for the recorded webinar. And then I'll turn off the recording. And if anybody wants to share or just chat about their plans, you're welcome to. So if you have any questions you want to share in the chat or unmute about what we've gone over so far. Was everybody able to get the link okay for Caterpillars Count? Can I get a thumbs up if you were able to open up the Caterpillars Count link in the chat? Awesome, thank you. Okay, great. So if we don't have any questions, um, thanks everyone, that's great. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, but hang on the line if you wanna chat.
Oh, I did have one question. Uh, what's the protocol for returning the bugs? That's a great question. So caterpillars count is a non-invasive study. So we're not collecting specimens and putting them in jars and keeping them in alcohol and so on. Um, instead, you uh, examine the insects on the leaves without actually touching them at all. Or if you're using the beet sheet, they fall onto the cloth and you look at them, maybe measure them with your ruler um, and then just flip the cloth onto the forest floor and all of the insects are free to roam. Um, so it doesn't harm them. It doesn't harm the trees at all. Again, as you're tapping the, the branch over the beet sheet, um, it's just 10 taps with like a half inch wide stick, uh, just enough to dislodge the bugs. And the caterpillars count training video is about two minutes long for the beet sheet protocol. So I recommend you take a look at that if you're interested. There's a PDF of how to build a beet sheet and then a two minute video on how to use it at that caterpillars count website. So that's what we based our protocols on um, for the field. Great question. All right, give me one second. Uh, 